2025 is coming to an end and it's time to look at all the good things that will happen in 2026. From the defeat of malaria in Africa and other huge advancements in medicine, to carbon-free steel, the search for Earth-like worlds and a historic win for the ocean. I'm Freddy and here are plenty of good things that will change in 2026. The first thing to look forward to is an enormous expansion of clean energy. Just recently, we looked at how important clean energy became in 2025 in our recap video. Well, but 2026, it looks like it will be an even bigger year. So let me tell you about some of the largest projects expected to finish in 2026. Let's start with solar. The spotlight might be on China these days, but other countries are following their lead. Take the Philippines, for example. They are building the world's largest hybrid solar facility. Hybrid means it will combine solar panels with a battery storage system. The battery allows power to be supplied even at night. The farm will start to operate at the beginning of the year as part of phase one. Then, once phase two is finished in 2027, it will operate at full power. And when it reaches this point, it will supply clean energy to 2.4 million homes. Wind power developments are also at play. The USA's biggest offshore wind farm will be fully operational by the end of the year. And it will provide power to 660,000 homes. But an even bigger one is being planned in China as we speak. And this one will be one of the biggest in the region. This wind farm is going to have a capacity of 3 gigawatts. And it is expected to have a size roughly a third of New York City when it's completed in 2026. The energy it generates will be sent to customers by a transmission station. Much like this huge one in New Mexico, which will also be finished by the middle of the year. It will convert the winds of New Mexico into power for cities in California and Arizona. Once up and running in 2026, it's going to supply 3 million people annually. And it looks like hydropower is going to have a great year as well. Colombia's largest hydroelectric generation plant entered limited service in late 2024. It's a massive dam, about half the height of the Empire State Building. In 2026, they are going to install the last four electric generators. Once that's done, it will be able to supply 18% of Colombia's total energy demand. And then there's Africa's biggest hydroelectric facility. 45% of Ethiopians do not have access to electricity. The recently opened Grand Ethiopian Dam will help address this throughout 2026. A portion of the power will go to the people in need, while the rest will be sold to nearby countries. Geothermal power is also catching up. This is when water is pumped down into the deep, hot layers of the Earth. This produces steam, which is then used to drive a generator to make electricity. And a next-generation geothermal plant in the USA will work just like that. It's using an innovative technique called horizontal drilling to dig down to the hottest spots. The deepest source is over 4,500 meters below the ground. That's like stacking 50 Statues of Liberty on top of one another. And in 2026, it will begin providing 24-7 power to 350,000 households in Southern California. So far, we have talked about some of the more established renewable sources. Now let's talk about one that's less well known. Green hydrogen. We need hydrogen for stuff like oil refining, steel production, fertilizers, plastics and other heavy industrial processes. Most of the time, though, it is produced using fossil fuels like natural gas. This is called grey hydrogen, because it wasn't made in an eco-friendly way. It only becomes green hydrogen when it is graded with renewable energy. Currently, though, it costs three times more to make than grey hydrogen. And this leads us to a promising development that will make it cheaper. 2026 will witness the first shipment of green hydrogen across the Atlantic Ocean. But it won't actually be sent over as hydrogen. That's because it needs to be cooled to extreme temperatures. And only a few ships and terminals in the world can currently handle that. That's why it will be broken down into ammonia and methanol. These chemicals don't need to be cooled to such extreme temperatures, making them easier and less expensive to store and transport. 
I know, a single delivery across the Atlantic might sound pretty insignificant at first. But this shipment is basically the starting point for a global green hydrogen supply chain. And much of it could eventually come from Saudi Arabia. Right now, they are putting the finishing touches on the world's largest green hydrogen plant. By mid-2026, it will have full solar and wind power generation. And once it opens, it's going to produce 600 tons of clean hydrogen every single day. Meanwhile in Scandinavia, they are making green hydrogen an essential ingredient in steel making. The steel industry accounts for 7% of all global carbon emissions. That's because they burn lots of fossil fuels to transform iron ore into iron. The very same thing, however, can be done with solar, wind and green hydrogen. And engineers in Sweden have shown that a carbon-free method can be performed on an industrial scale. It involves a hydrogen storage system located 30 meters underground. This facility has been linked up to a nearby steel factory. And this setup has an innovative pricing mechanism, which is linked to the global renewable energy market. When green electricity costs are low, the factory is powered by wind and solar. At the same time, the storage facility takes advantage of the cheap, clean electricity to produce extra green hydrogen. This creates a surplus. When prices are high, the factory changes power supply to green hydrogen. Switching between solar, wind and green hydrogen in this way makes steel production carbon-free. And it makes it cheaper as well. 25 to 40% cheaper to be exact. The hybrid pilot project has been operational since 2022. But it's been so successful that it will continue into 2026. Carbon-free steel is the future. But traditional steel is definitely not. Its emissions are simply too high. Which is why the European Union is stepping in with a major new law in 2026. The European Union is very serious about its climate ambitions. By 2030, they want to cut their greenhouse gas emissions by 55%. But not every business within Europe wants to get on board. This results in carbon leakage. That's when businesses move their carbon emitting operations outside the EU. Usually, this is to a place with less strict climate policy. The EU is tackling this with the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Essentially, producers of carbon intensive products like steel will have to pay a carbon tax on imported goods. It ensures that European businesses that pay their climate taxes can compete with outside rivals. While at the same time, it lowers the total carbon footprint of the EU. The mechanism will come into effect on January 1st. And just 48 hours earlier, another major law will also come into force. About two years ago, European countries agreed to tighten the rules on how products linked to deforestation can enter the market. It's a major step towards deforestation-free supply chains. The bill bans EU businesses from buying goods from places that have been recently deforested. Meanwhile, businesses outside the EU have to prove that products don't come from deforested areas. Timber and other agricultural products will have to meet three requirements before they are sent to Europe. Let me emphasize here that the idea is not to punish the EU's trading partners. Instead, the new restrictions are aimed to encourage them to develop stronger deforestation laws inside their own borders. Indonesia, Ghana and Vietnam, for example, have already designed national action plans to prepare for the regulation. And after many years of delays, it is finally being implemented on New Year's Eve this year. Also in January, another massive regulation is coming into effect. And honestly, this might be one of the best pieces of good news of the year. On January 17th, the High Seas Treaty will take effect. It will represent a historic moment for global marine conservation. But why? To understand the significance, I want you to think about land. Most land on the Earth is owned by one nation or another. But this is not the case with the oceans. They are so enormous that many parts of it are not owned by anyone. In fact, two-thirds of the seas are not governed by anyone. This makes it difficult to enforce environmental regulations in these places. The High Seas Treaty addresses this gap. It allows UN member states to create marine protected areas in these isolated regions. And it gives them access to the tools they need to protect and manage it. This is literally one of the biggest wins for the ocean in decades. 
The treaty required 60 UN ratifications to enter into force. And Morocco became the crucial number 60 at the end of 2025. Which means it can now officially go into effect. Some of those same countries have also been involved in another major piece of legislation. In 2024, the AI Act was accepted by all member states of the European Union. We all know that this technology has the potential to be very dangerous. That is why the EU put controls on the AI market. Since it came into force, it has slowly been strengthened. In February 2025, general rules were laid down. It prohibited things like manipulating or deceiving other people using AI. Then, in August, another set of regulations were added. They specifically targeted general-purpose AI, like ChatGPT. One of the rules states that these apps will now have to remove copyrighted material at the request of the owner. So basically, we can tell them to stop using good news content to train their models. Now, all that is left to regulate are high-risk AIs. These are AI tools and programs used in sensitive areas like safety, finance and law enforcement. And the first of these measures will make an appearance in eight months from now. They will make sure that high-risk AIs have to meet strict safety requirements before they can be publicly sold. Then the second batch will be passed in August 2027. But let's not forget that AI can actually be really good for many things. I mean, just look at the impact it's going to have in medicine. And in particular, on the gene editing software CRISPR. This advanced tool cuts and modifies DNA with robotic precision. These small edits are most useful for curing genetic diseases. As you might expect, operating CRISPR requires a lot of training and expertise. Even experienced scientists can find it difficult to use. This is where CRISPR GPT comes in. Think of it like ChatGPT, but for editing genes. CRISPR GPT has been trained on 11 years of data that comes from past CRISPR experiments. It uses this knowledge to give scientists useful suggestions or things to avoid when designing new experiments. And as a result, it makes things a lot faster. Plus, it makes CRISPR so easy to operate that even beginners can use it effectively. The higher speed means that life-saving drugs could now be created faster while the ease of use allows more scientists to participate. Over the course of 2026, scientists will be investigating rare genetic diseases, blood disorders, cancer, diabetes and autoimmune disorders, to name just a few. Excitingly, some of them will be entering their final stages. Which means you can expect a lot of good news stories talking about them. And you will also be seeing a lot of updates in the field of mRNA vaccines. Having helped us defeat COVID, they are now being used to destroy cancer. With this in mind, we have to talk about a groundbreaking recent study. It involved participants with advanced lung cancer. And it found that the survival rate of cancer patients who took the COVID mRNA vaccine nearly doubled. They lived on average for 37 months, rather than the normal 21. Researchers found that the shot wakes up and alerts the body's immune system. The next step is to confirm the findings in clinical trials. And this is just one of 120 mRNA cancer vaccine projects predicted to make progress in 2026. And it will be the same for HIV. This comes off the back of a major breakthrough. For the first time, scientists showed in 2025 that they could stimulate a targeted immune response against HIV. This showed that a cure for HIV is a realistic goal. And this is just the beginning. This trial was only the third time an mRNA HIV vaccine has been tested. In 2026, you should expect to see many more that build on these results. Eventually, they could be used in a mass immunization program, just like the one happening in Africa right now. Roughly half a million Africans die from malaria every year. But that death rate will soon go down. Two new malaria vaccines are currently being rolled out across the continent. 75% of malaria cases are prevented when they are taken with other drugs. As of November 2025, 24 countries have introduced them. And in 2026, they will be making their way to Burkina Faso, the DRC, Nigeria, Mozambique and Uganda. All of these advances are sure to save lives. And in the last two years, we found out that global life expectancy has more than doubled, compared to 120 years ago. In 1900, it was just 32 years. And now, it's about 73 years. 
This jump is largely thanks to the huge drop in infant mortality over the last 100 years. And this trend is going to continue into 2026. That's according to a survey that analyzed 23 countries. Although slower than last century, life expectancy will continue to increase. And so will progress in space exploration. The European Space Agency is building something that might find the next Earth. The goal of the unmanned Plato spacecraft is to explore planets that are very similar to our own. It will explore segments of space where Earth-like worlds could exist. To do this, it will narrow its search to habitable zones in the orbit of sun-like stars. These zones have the perfect temperature for liquid water. It will observe and measure these distant objects with 26 high-tech cameras. And it's going to blast off in December 2026. And that's one month after the Bepi Colombo mission reaches Mercury. Mercury is one of the most mysterious planets in our solar system. For one, it's incredibly difficult to observe from Earth. That's because it's always very close to the Sun. And getting there is even more challenging. Not just because of the intense heat, but because the Sun's powerful gravity makes it extremely hard for spacecraft to slow down and enter orbit. NASA sent their own probe there about a decade ago, but it was unable to stay near the surface for too long, so not a lot of good data was collected. The Bepi Colombo mission will do what NASA couldn't do. It's a joint project involving the European and Japanese space agencies. In 2018, they sent two orbiters into space. Both are different from the ones NASA sent before. They are made of more heat-resistant material. Plus, they have built-in cooling systems that keep the most complex instruments at room temperature. The Bepi Colombo has been on a cosmic adventure for the last seven years. And in November 2026, its journey will end when it finally arrives at Mercury. And the moment it does, another journey will begin for three countries back on Earth. On November 24th, Laos, Nepal and Bangladesh will officially graduate from the UN's list of least developed countries. The system was set up in 1971 to help the poorest nations. While in LDC, these states receive support from richer countries to help their development. In 2021, it was announced Laos, Nepal and Bangladesh had done enough to graduate. Each proved they had a per capita income of above $1,300. And they showed enough improvement in their education, health and economic sectors. Graduation is going to benefit them in two ways. It will improve their international image and it will encourage more outside investment. And members of the FCFTA could well provide this. This free trade partnership came into existence in 2018, when 44 countries signed up. Its objective is to make it a single market for the African continent. By binding Africa together, goods and services will be easier to buy, sell and invest in. And in turn, the continent's global economic position will be strengthened. If all goes to plan, the FCFTA is predicted to raise the total GDP of Africa by $1.4 trillion by 2045. There are now 54 members. So far, they have already removed 90% of all tariffs. And from January 1, 2026, the organization will be getting rid of a further 7%. So, which of these developments are you most excited to see in 2026? Let me know down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching and I really hope that you have an amazing 2026. Have a good new year and I will see you in the next video. Bye bye!